All right. Today, as I said, we're going to finish talking about elimination reaction. So let's get back into finishing our E1 mechanism. This is the carbocation version of the elimination reaction. And um, to do it in the case of an alcohol, uh, where it's, it's one of the most frequent places where we see it, we need to convert the OH to a better leaving group. So that's what putting the acid does. The OH by itself allows the leaving group. But by putting the proton on, converting it to water, water is a better leaving group. It's still not a really, really great leaving group, but it's okay. It leaves to make the tertiary carbocation. We don't get an E2 version of this, not because water isn't a good enough leaving group, but in fact, principally because there's no reasonably strong base present. Water is the strongest base that's present here, and it's kind of a lousy base. So we simply ionize that away to make the carbocation. That, by the way, is our rate determining step of all the mechanism steps that's involved in here. That's the most energetically expensive. And once we get to the carbocation, there should be a little voice in your head that says, every time I see a carbocation in a reaction mechanism, regardless of where it comes from, first I think about resonance. That's not relevant in this particular case. And then we think about the three fates of a carbocation. In this particular case, we know what we're trying to get to the elimination product. So we're going to try to pick the fate or fates that get us there. Capture a nucleophile isn't going to help. Rearrangement, something to be thought about, but the carbocation that's produced is tertiary. It can't get any better than that in this particular case. So we're simply left with B deprotonated. Remember that B, uh, carbocation deprotonation, very easy to do. Don't need a strong base to do it. Water, certainly good enough for that. And any hydrogen, which is beta to where the positive charge carbon is, can be removed. So we're looking for positive charge on a carbon, carbon hydrogen. It is that hydrogen that we're interested in. So there is a total of nine of them in this particular case. We can take either two of the hydrogens at the four o'clock position or the six o'clock position. Those guys, they lead to the same product. And that would give us a tri-substituted internal alkene. Or there are the three hydrogens out here on the methyl group, right? It's carbon with a positive charge, carbon to hydrogen. So there's the alkene. Two different alkene products are formed. We'd like to pick which one is major, but we talked last time about a way, a general rule to use when you have two competing mechanism steps or entire mechanism pathways. In this particular case, it's only one mechanism step that's the difference. The one which is produced in the greatest amount is the product generally which is the most stable one, right? So in this case, there, there, there are different kinds of alkenes. Your right internal would be the major one because it's more stable. This alkene is internal and it is tri-substituted. One, two, three. Don't think of the ring as just one attachment. It's the, simply the number of carbons, the number of, S, the number of carbons directly bonded to the alkene carbon. So this is internal, tri-substituted. This other one is terminal di substituted, so this is the major product. So it follows Zaitsev's rule. E1 always, 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 never, ever, ever violates Zaitsev's rule. You had a question? Uh, you said you need to say the seven. I just heard I, I didn't hear anything about it. One, two, three, four. Four and three make seven, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I didn't say nine. No, not me. I'm not human, so I don't make mistakes, <laughs> right? The expression isn't, you know, it's, it's a chimpanzee to make mistakes, right? It's human to make, never mind. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. You're absolutely right, because I haven't had enough coffee. There we go. Now, if we wanted to talk about the kinetics, of course, kinetics have been useful. This is like the last reaction where we're really going to spend a lot of emphasis on the kinetics, but uh, if we wanted to talk about the kinetics, it's a multi-step process. This particular one involves protonating the OH, ionization of the carbon leaving group bond to make the carbocation, and then carbocation fates. Of those, this is your rate determining step right here, the ionization of the carbon leaving group bond. It's the only step in the mechanism where you're throwing away a bond and not gaining anything back. This is also the second example of four we will see this quarter, the second example in which carbocation formation is rate determining. We will talk about four, four mechanisms that involve carbocations, and in every single case, the carbocation formation is the most energetically expensive step, therefore rate determining. So when we write the rate expression, it involves only this step. It involves only the thing being ionized. And so consequently, we call it elimination unimolecular E1, very much parallel to SN1. 
Now, don't confuse this with SM1. They are different, they, they are different mechanisms. They both have carbocations. They differ in the carbocation fates, but there are a lot of parallels between E1 and SM1. All right, on the next page, we're going to have our E1 reaction checklist. It's the last of our little checklists that we have. <coughs> and we're going to ask the same question here, the same question we asked for SN2 and SN1 and E2. What do I need to have to make this reaction proceed at a reasonable rate? Now, if you didn't have the list in front of you and you're trying to figure it out, you would say, okay, it's based on making the rate determining step as easy as possible, making the ionization of that carbon leaving group bond as easy as possible. And then you would think, wait a minute, I already know that. What other reaction that we made a little checklist for had ionization of the carbon leaving group bond as the rate determining step and therefore the step upon which the little checklist was built? SM1. Same rate determining step, exactly the same issues. What are the issues? Leaving group needs to be moderate or better. Carbocations got to be reasonably stable and you got to have the appropriately polar solvents. And just like SN1, those factors work together. The better the leaving group is, we can get away with a less stable carbocation. The more stable the carbocation is, we can get away with a less polar solvent and or a poor leaving group, et cetera. So they work together as a team, if you will. And you might say, but if they have the same rate determining step, how am I going to tell the difference between E1 and SM1? And as a matter of fact, if I have a molecule that has a leaving group in beta hydrogens, how do I know whether it's going to do E1 or, or, e, or uh, what's the other one? E1 or E2? Not enough copies. And matter of fact, if it's got a leaving group in a beta hydrogen and the carbon that bears the leaving group isn't too sterically hindered and the base is strong enough to do E2, well, that base might be a good enough nucleophile, so maybe it's going to do SM2. So how do I know? In other words, how do I pick between elimination and substitution? Which mechanism? So there's four mechanisms that, are com that potentially can compete when you have a molecule with a leaving group and something which could be a base slash nucleophile. Remember, the really only difference between base and a nucleophile is they both provide electrons. Base gives them the, uh, shares them with a hydrogen. Nucleophile shares them with a carbon. So how do we differentiate between them? Well, there's, there's really one fundamental thing to look at first, and that's whether or not you have to make a carbocation. Back when we talked about SN2 versus SM1, we said it's like getting out of the valley. Remember you're being chased by the tiger? How many of you have bad dreams now about being chased by tigers? If you do, I can recommend a good shrink. But does anybody dream about organic chemistry at this point? Anybody have those dreams? Yeah? Are they good dreams or not? Not so good dreams of being chased by carbocations or something? Actually, kind of slightly aside, if you dream about organic chemistry, that's not necessarily a bad thing. There are people who theorize that one of the things that's happening in dreams is your brain is organizing information and deciding how things go together, whether or not it needs to make neuron connections and put stuff in long-term memory. So if you're dreaming about organic chemistry, that probably means your brain is deciding whether or not this stuff is important. It's good. It means your brain is, hey, let's move this into long-term storage. So having dreams about organic chemistry is good. Having bad dreams about organic chemistry, on the other hand, may not be so good. All right, anyways. So number one, when we talked about SN2 and SN1, we said pick the non-carbocation pathway first. Try that one first because generally it's less energetically expensive. If everything else is equal, good leaving group, not sterically hindered, reasonably stable carbocation, et cetera, the SN2 pathway, which avoids that carbocation step, is generally faster. So looking at the whole manifold of E2, E1, SN2, and SM1, consider the non-carbocation pathways first, E2 and SN2. Now between these two, which one do we pick? This comes from an empirical observation. The empirical observation, what we know from studying these reactions time and time again in the laboratory, is for the most part, E2 occurs in preference to SN2 if the E2 conditions are met. So in other words, when you're looking at this reaction and saying, all right, is it E2 or SN2? Try E2 first. If the E2 conditions are met, with the exception of primary alkyl halides, if the E2 conditions are met, chances are the majority of the pathway is E2. Now the exception to that is 
primary alkyl halides in which that's reversed. So then we consider SN2 before E2. Why that is, that's a quirk of primary alkyl halides. I don't have a good answer for you. So there's no good rationale, no simple rationale as to why we consider E2 before SN2. It just, it just is. Now that leaves us with the SN1 and E1. Now when we're talking about which pathway is occurring, we're going to say the pathway that occurs fastest is the one that there's the majority of. So between, so basically we're saying in a lot of cases E2 occurs more quickly than SN2 if the E2 conditions are met. If not, you look at SN2. What about between E1 and SN1? Which one of those two always, never, sometimes occurs faster? What's if you wanted to compare the rate of reactions A and B, and they were multi-step mechanisms, what in those mechanisms would you look at? Rate determining step, right? If you're deciding that you want to drive from here to some other place, you're deciding, do I want to drive to El Segundo or Sherman Oaks today? You go, hmm, how bad is traffic to get off campus? That's not relevant. How bad is surface streets? That's not relevant. Those aren't rate determining. It's how bad is the 405? You're talking about going north or south from Wilshire Boulevard on the 405 on a Friday afternoon? I think actually the answer is El Segundo, Sherman Oaks, stay on campus. I vote for stay on campus. But I'm saying you, you think about the rate determining step in those two processes. So rate determining step for SN1 reaction is what? Ionization of a carbon leaving group bond. Rate determining step for E1 is? ionization of a carbon leaving group bond. They have exactly the rate determining step, same rate determining step. So what that means is we can't differentiate between the two. E1 and SN1 will compete in terms of rate. Both will happen. So we can't differentiate when it comes to this question. If we say, well, it can't be E2 or SN2 and we have to pick between E1 and SN1, the answer is yes, they both happen. Now there are some subtle things that favor one over the other. And we're not going to worry about those. So here's how we're going to do this. When you're deciding, the order of preference is look at E2 first, except for a primary alkyl halide. Do e, look at E2 first. If the E2 conditions are reasonably well met, pretty good base, pretty good leaving group, uh, periplanar beta hydrogen, then we say E2 is probably the major pathway. If E2 conditions aren't met, then we look for SN2, except for, of course, the case of primary alkyl halides, we look at SN2 before E2. If the SN2 conditions are reasonably well met, then we assume SN2 is the major pathway. If not, we look at the carbocation pathways. But that doesn't mean that these have to happen. There is one case that we've talked about that would shut all of these down. One variable that's bad for all four of these. It is present. It's no matter how good everything else is. If that thing is present, if it's part of your reaction, no, no E2, no SN2, no E1, no SN1, none of those occur. What is it? Terrible. Terrible leaving group, right? So if your leaving group is something like fluoride, basically none of these do it. All right. Now, some cases in the real world, many cases in the real world involve borderline mechanisms or hybrid mechanisms or mixed mechanisms, whatever you want to call them. They may also give lots of mixtures of products. We're not going to fuss about that so much. We're simply generally just going to predict a major one. All righty, before we end our elimination discussion, there is one question I need to ask. And we have this on page 21 of our lecture supplement. <coughs> True scientific fact. We know from many, many, many studies that reactions, SN1 and E1 reactions, occur faster in the Arctic and the Antarctic than they do at the equator. Kid you not, scientific fact. Now, if we're going to talk about why that is, of course, we're talking about rate. And for these processes, this would be the rate determining step. If this is our SM1 and that's our E1 product, that's our rate determining step. So what is it about the Arctic and the Antarctic that favors this process more than the equator? What do you, give me an idea. Good idea? Not the right answer. Yeah. It's more polar. That's right. Right? The Arctic, North Pole, and the Antarctic, the South Pole. And we know because this is ionization step, right? It's favored by polarity. But you're going to go, no, 
I don't believe that. Well, we've done studies. We have conclusive evidence, right? So there's our solvent effect. <laughs> Camera guy, can you see that? Camera lady, I'm sorry, right? So he's the polar bear. See, and he's polar. He's got a delta plus on one paw, a delta minus on the other. And like the solvent, he's assisting the ionization. So that's why those reactions are faster in the North Pole and the South Pole, because they're more polar. Now, someone always says at this point, but there's no polar bears in the South Pole. It's true, but this is a joke, okay? <laughs> Your magnetic field idea is interesting, but it's, you know, it's a joke. And by the way, we're soon not going to have polar bears in the North Pole either, but all right, enough of that. All right, so now we're going to talk about addition reactions to carbon-carbon pi bonds. And this is a completely different fundamental group of reactions that we've talked about before. We've talked about substitution reactions in which one portion of the molecule is replaced by some other new group. We've talked about elimination reactions where some portions of the molecule are lost to make a pi bond. Now we're going to talk about what is fundamentally the reverse of addition or the reverse of elimination, where the pi bond goes away and it's replaced by new things. All right, so let's, uh, let's do an example here, just so we can get our thought process. One can take ethylene and water, and under the appropriate conditions, these guys will react to make ethyl alcohol, you know, ethyl alcohol, drinking stuff. Now, as we're going to discover later on, this requires a catalyst to do this. But this is an addition reaction in that we have the re all, the, all the atoms or all the functional group, well, that's a bad way to say it. The, we have all the atoms of the reactants. They're just now present in one molecule. Another way to say it is we've taken this guy and added this to it. Now, this actually is one way to make ethanol. Most of the ethanol in the world is made by fermentation from corn and things like that. But if you want anhydrous ethanol without water, this is usually the way it's done. We would like to talk a little bit about this kind of process. It's a useful functional group transformation because there's lots of different alkenes, lots of different ways to make them. Alcohols are very useful, but it turns out we can add lots of other things to carbon-carbon pi bonds as well. So to understand fundamentally how this process works, First, we need to talk a little bit about this functional group. How might it behave? Can we identify a nucleophile, an electrophile, and so forth? So let's talk about the structure of an alkene. Can you, camera, can you see over here? Do I need to turn lights on? You're okay? All right. Let's think about what the structure of an alkene looks like so we can begin to get a handle on how it might behave. Typical alkene, of course, has a carbon carbon sigma bond, and for our purposes, the sigma bond's pretty much unimportant. It basically just keeps the carbons together. We're interested in this portion. Each of the carbons, which are sp2 hybridized, has a p orbital. So here's one p orbital, here's another p orbital. They are parallel to each other, and what happens when you take two p orbitals and make them parallel to each other? They overlap. So we get overlap up here, overlap down here, and that means we have, there's the sigma, this is pi, and this is pi. We have one lobe of pi above the plane of the molecule and one lobe below. These two together make one pi bond. Now let's just finish the rest of the molecule here so we can see what its structure is. Use the ethylene case. So each of the carbons are sp2 hybridized. They're trigonal planar so that the two hydrogens and the other carbon lie in the plane. Pi electrons above and below. Let me give you an alternate way of thinking about that. This is a representation of a pi bond. It's not quite rigorous to say it is a pi bond because actually it's just a hunk of plastic and some foam balls. But it's close enough for our purposes. So here we have an sp2 carbon. Here we have an sp2 carbon. The carbon-carbon sigma bond, the carbon-hydrogen sigma bonds are built using the sp2 orbitals. Here is one p orbital on this carbon. Here's another p orbital on this carbon. They overlap in the space in between them. So we end up with a big blob of pi electron density up here and a big blob of pi electron density below here. 
me give you a metaphor to think about that. Warning, if you haven't had lunch, you may not like this metaphor. This is like a sandwich. Pi electron bread, pi electron bread, uh, sigma bond meat, or peanut butter and jelly, or nosh, or whatever it is you put on your, you know, whatever it is you put on there, right? That's a way to think about it. You imagine Homer going, mmm, pi, electron. Now, I'm also going to talk about, let me bring this over here, I'm also going to talk about alkynes, because an alkyne, very similar to an alkene, and that's why we study them together. If you understand reactions of alkenes, by default, you understand an awful lot about reactions of alkynes. The alkyne is a carbon-carbon triple bond. I'll do the simplest case, acetylene. So it has a sigma bond framework, and the carbons are sp hybridized. So that's going to be sp. Uh, it's a little harder to draw the, the orbitals because I'm not much of an artist and they're kind of a three-dimensional thing. So each of the carbons has one set of p orbitals that overlap here and here to make pi bond. But there's also another set of p orbitals which is perpendicular to these. So we have one here, back there, back there, one here. Uh, these are not intended to be small. They're just in perspective. They're in the back. So there's an overlap here. And then there's an overlap in the back. I told you I'm a lousy artist. So let's look at it using a model. There's an sp carbon in there. There's an sp carbon in there. And the hydrogen to carbon to carbon hydrogen bonds are all sigma bonds. They're all built by using the carbon uh, sp orbitals. And what that leaves left over is each carbon having two p orbitals. One set here, which I have in yellow, per, uh, parallel to each other. So there is a pi bond here and here. That's one pi bond. And then there is another set of p orbitals, which I have in blue. So one p orbital here, another p orbital back here. Those are also parallel and they overlap. So we end up with two pi bonds here, kind of a cloud around. Now, to do the food metaphor, if this is a sandwich, then what is this? It's a corn dog. Everybody says corn dog. Then there's a stick sticking out of the top of the corn dog. Okay. Corn dog you've already eaten some of, maybe. But yeah, it looks like a corn dog, right? It also might be it also might be a cotton candy. You like cotton candy? All right, that's another choice. What's well, a little more California than cotton candy? A kebab. A kebab? <laughs> another good choice. Been the hardest quarter to get some people to say what that used to be. Everybody always said one thing. So if you think about this, this has got the carbohydrate on the top and the bottom, but here's the meat. What food is the carbohydrate wrapped all the way around it? A burrito, A burrito right? It's, right? Or or it's carbons with a lavash wrap, little avocado on the side. Nonetheless, electrons all the way around. Now, what does that tell us? Well, there's a couple of things that it tells us. Number one. This guy, the double bond, is resistant to rotation around the sigma bond. This is impossible to do, essentially, with a carbon-carbon double bond. Why is that? Well, imagine you start this way and you begin to do the rotation. Why does this cost energy? By the way, this is a lot of energy this costs. Energy up, 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 really high energy. What is it? What, it's right, less stability. Why is it less stable? Broke the pi bond, right. This is good because these p orbitals are parallel. They overlap. I have the pi bond. When the p orbitals no longer are parallel, you throw away the pi bond, and that's about 60 kilocalories you've thrown away. So unlike a normal single sigma bond, the carbon-carbon double bond is, for all intents and purposes, rigid. You can't rotate around it. Now I'll give you an angels dancing on the head of a pin question. Anybody who's taken a philosophy class? Anybody know about angels dancing on the head of a pin? Ever hear that question? How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? It's a philosophical kind of question. So this is a philosophical question. Can I rotate around a carbon-carbon triple bond? In other words, if I hold this half of the bond back here still, can I do this? No? Yes? I'm here to tell you that we don't know the answer to that question. The reason we don't know the answer is because 
you really can't tell because the carbon-carbon triple bond, because of its axial symmetry down here, right, through the bond axis, assuming, the bond, assuming these P orbitals were all the same color, if I said, see, look at this, and I put it down here and brought it back up, you wouldn't be able to tell whether or not I rotated. <laughs> but there's colors, so you can, and I know you're a UCLA student, so I'm not going to trick you and go, did I rotate? <laughs> Even my eight-year-old granddaughter, I think, would know that one. Did I rotate? So you might say, well, no, you can't rotate because that involves breaking pi bonds. And it's true. As I begin to do that rotation, see the pi bonds go away. But as I'm breaking the blue-blue pi bond, the blue-yellow pi bond is beginning to form. It's pi electrons all the way around. It's the corn dog kebab burrito effect. <laughs> and whatever else it is that we talked in there that, that I missed. So it's really, we don't know. So, but it's a moot point because it doesn't, we can't detect it. So we don't talk about that. But there is something else we can talk about that is a similarity between these guys, why we put these together, and, then, and of course, why they even behave the way they do at all. Let us imagine, in terms of how they behave, let us imagine that you're cruising around in your reaction beaker. So imagine you're a molecule. It's Friday night. It's almost Friday night. You're looking, you know, you're looking to react. You've got a lone pair. You want to react. <laughs> Maybe you have an open octet, you know? but you're looking for re react. So across the, across the single bar beaker, you see this lovely alkene, or maybe this lovely alkyne, but let's just do the lovely alkene for the moment. You go, hey, I want to bond with that alkene. <laughs> Why would you want to bond with that alkene? What do you see when you look at that alkene? The first thing that another molecule sees when it looks at that alkene is, let me put it that way, <laughs> pi electrons, right? What filthy minds you have. <laughs> Bree, remind me never ever to do this again. <laughs> Every time. I always, it, <laughs> All right, anyways. Remember, you're a molecule. You don't care about those things. You only care about <laughs> pi electron density sticking out. So when you see, I think UCLA is going to take me off of YouTube. <laughs> so when you see this, you see the pi electron density here and here. Now, what kind of thing, because those pi electrons are sticking out in space, what kinds of things do you think alkenes like to react with? This is electron excess, pi electrons sticking out in space. So what does it like to react with? Electrophiles. Alkenes, for the most part, therefore, are going to be nucleophiles because of that pi electrons. And it's the same thing with an alkyne. And what do nucleophiles generally like to react with? Electrophiles. So Source of electrons, it's going to react usually with an electrophile of some sort, which is why these addition reactions, not all of them, many of them will be electrophilic in nature. Many of them will be an electrophile interacting with the pi bond. And actually, we've already then begun to identify what the generic mechanism would be. This, the pi bond is a nucleophile, and we're going to react it with an electrophile, so let's see where that goes. So let's write a generic addition mechanism. Now, I caution you that this doesn't apply in all cases, but it's a place to begin our thought process. We're going to take an alkene, just a generic alkene, don't know what it's attached to. We'll just say there's some points of attachment, and we're going to react that with some sort of electrophile. I'm not going to give the electrophile a charge. Maybe it's positive, maybe it's not. I don't know because we're being very generic. But we do know that the pi electrons are the nucleophile, and they're going to form a bond with the electrophile. Sigma bonds remain intact. I've made a new bond to the electrophile. So what I've done is sacrifice the carbon-carbon pi bond and use that to make a new sigma bond between the carbon and the electrophile. There's my new bond. The pi bond is going away, but I'm missing something. What should this carbon have? Positive charge. Carbon with three bonds has a positive charge. It started neutral. It gave up electrons. Again, I don't know what the charge in the electrophile is because I don't know what it was to begin with, but I definitely know I have a carbocation. All right, at this point, without a whole lot of prompting, but I'll prompt you anyways, when you see this thing, there should be a little voice in the back of your mind. And that voice doesn't say, when is class over? That's not the voice I mean. 
Not the voice that says, man, the polar bear joke was stupid. I waited four weeks for that. And it's just downhill from here. That polar bear joke is like the transition state, all downhill from here. <laughs> but every time you see a carbocation in a reaction mechanism, regardless of where it comes from, the very first thing you think about is? No, come on. Where's my discussion section, people? What did we say today? Resonance, right? There's a couple of reasons we think about resonance. It turns out in this particular case, because we're being generic, we do not know whether or not the resonance is there. So we're not going to worry about that. But after we've considered resonance, then we think about, now we, or carbocation phase. That's right. So this could potentially rearrange, capture a nucleophile, lose a proton. But we're talking about addition. So which fate do we definitely want to use? Maybe rearrangement occurs. We don't know what the carbocation is. We're being generic. Maybe it's there. Maybe it's not. Don't know. Lose a proton? Lose a proton makes pi bonds. We're trying to get rid of a pi bond. So that's not, hap that's not going to move us forward. It doesn't mean that it won't go backwards. If the electrophile is a proton, it certainly can go backwards. We're going to see examples of that. So that leaves us with rearrangement, maybe. Lose a proton, no. Leaves us with capture a nucleophile. Okay, we're being generic. Here's a nucleophile. Usually, not always a lone pair, but usually a lone pair. There's our nucleophile. So the other bond, or the other carbon of what used to be the carbon-carbon pi bond is now bonded to the electrophile. So overall, what we've done is we've sacrificed the pi bond to make a new bond to something which is an electrophile plus a new bond to something which is a nucleophile. The electrophile and nucleophile could start in the beginning of the reaction as separate entities, or when this pi bond uh, interacts with the electrophile, maybe there's something attached that goes away that comes back later. I don't know. We'll see examples of that. But that's essentially what's going on here now. Now there's a number of things that we can already conclude about this. We already are probably in a position to think about the kinetics of this process. And we're not going to get really deep into this, but it's again useful to recognize, since it's a two-step mechanism here, it is useful to recognize which rate, which step is rate determining, and therefore when we talk about making changes, changing the alkene, changing the electrophile, whatever, what might matter. So let's see what we have. Alkene reacts with electrophile to make new carbon electrophile sigma bond and positive charge carbocation. Carbocation captures nucleophile, making a new sigma bond and getting rid of the positive charge. Which step do we think is rate determining? Making carbocation or quenching carbocation? Making carbocation. That's rate determining step. This is example number three. So we're three and O, or O and three, however you want to think about it, for multi-step mechanisms in which the rate determining step is carbocation formation. We'll see one later on in this course, but that's worth three, three examples of that so far. That means when we're playing with an electrophilic addition to a pi bond here, most of the time, this is the step we're going to focus on. It suggests that many times the nature of the nucleophile isn't going to matter so much, kind of like SM1 and E1. All right, now we are in a position, we kind of have a generic mechanism. Oh, one last thing I want to say before we, uh, two last things actually I want to say before we leave this mechanism. Number one, this is a generic mechanism, it's our first guess. We will discover that not all additions to pi bonds involve two steps. Some of them are one step, some of them are more than one, or more than two steps. Also, in not every case will there be a distinct electrophile and nucleophile. Sometimes it'll be really hard to identify, impossible to identify what they are. We'll deal with those cases. Another issue is that some stu students will be looking at this and going, oh, okay, I recognize this step. This step is called SM1. Uh-uh, this step is not SM1. Do you see substitution? SM1 is substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. Do you see substitution? No, this is addition. So SM1 is a whole mechanism Capture a nucleophile is just one carbocation step. Don't, don't confuse them. They, SM1 and this, this mechanism both have capture a nucleophile, but those mechanisms are not both called SM1. All right, now let's look at a particular addition, a nice simple one. I guess I can erase this. Let's talk about addition of hydrogen 
halides, Hx. So here we're talking about Hx, X equals uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So I'm going to cross off fluorine, even though it fits within this sequence very nicely, it turns out it just doesn't work very well. And if you want to know, come and ask me why, and I'll be happy to tell you. It has to do with hydrogen bonding. So here is our molecule we're going to add. Now we said if we're going to add to an alkene, let us suppose we're going to react our HX with isobutylene. We know that isobutylene is the nucleophile, so HX has to be the electrophile. What is it about hydrogen attached to chlorine, bromine, or iodine that makes it an electrophile? Remember way back when to the kinds of things you look at a molecule and go, ha, on this molecule I see this feature, therefore I think it's going to be an electrophile. What does HX, ha HX have, HCl, let's say, or HBr have, that you would say, aha, HBr is an electrophile? Lone pairs? No, try again. Lone pairs are electrons to be given away. When the guy out in the street is begging for money, usually it's not the guy who's got like wads of money sticking out of his pocket. That's the guy who should be giving it away. This is wads of money sticking out of your pocket. A good leaving group? It doesn't necessarily have to be, have a good leaving group to be uh, an electrophile, but that's a, a reasonable thought. No, that influences it. It doesn't say electronegativity causes what I'm thinking of. I feel like a dentist today. Di dipole, dipole, oh, you're right, you're close enough. Close enough. You, you, you guys said kebab and corn dog for the alkyne, so all right, we'll give it to you. Delta plus delta minus. In other words, that hydrogen halide bond is polar because hydrogen is less electronegative than chlorine, bromine, or iodine. It is the delta plus on the hydrogen that allows us to identify this as something which is electron deficient. That makes it an electrophile. So what we're going to do is to say, what happens if I react this? We'll use HBr, for example. What happens if I take an alkene, a nucleophile, and react it with HBr, an electrophile? Now, the thought process we're going to go through here is a common kind of thing when you don't know a mechanism. This is a real simple case, but when you don't know a mechanism, start by looking at the reactants and saying, what do I know about the way they behave? Don't reinvent the wheel unless you have to. What do we know? We know that alkenes are nucleophiles. We just talked about this. This is the only alkene reaction we know so far, even though we only know it for 20 minutes. This is the only reaction we know, this being a nucleophile. So we'll start with alkene nucleophile. Oh, that must mean that HBr is the electrophile. That's what we're going to use in this example. And it's a good idea, by the way, to start to assuming that your reaction is a nucleophile-electrophile reaction. Almost all reactions that we talk about in this course, not all, but almost all, are nucleophile-electrophile reactions. So the HBr has to be the electrophile. There's the delta plus on the hydrogen end. So we'll use, again, delta plus, delta minus. The alkene is going to form the bond. The alkene pi electrons will form the bond of the hydrogen. Of course, the HBr bond has to be broken. Hydrogen can only be attached to one thing at a time. Does this look like any other kind of reaction, by the way? In addition to being an addition, if you'll pardon the pun, in addition to being an addition to a pi bond reaction, A hydrogen is being moved from HBr to the alkene. A hydrogen is being moved. It's not a rearrangement. It's an acid-base reaction. The alkene is the, is the base. It's an awful base, as it turns out. The HBr is the acid. The hydrogen been moving, is moving around. All right, so we're going to add that uh, proton to the alkene. And according to our generic mechanism, what we do is we sacrifice the carbon-carbon pi -bon -bond, bond to make a new, a lot of food today. Just thought about it. Pie bonds, right? Corn dogs, all that other kind of stuff. It's a food day. So when we, we're going to sacrifice that pi bond to make a new CH bond. And the problem is, when we make that new CH bond, we have two different places we could put it. We could put it right there. In other words, I'm making the bond from here to the hydrogen. That gives us that carbocation, or I could put it here, 
which makes a different carbocation. Now, one thing that confuses students a little bit at this point, and I wish we had a good way to get around this confusion, but we don't, is this curved arrow. This curved arrow that starts in the middle of the pi bond, it is unclear simply from the curved arrow where we are putting that hydrogen. And that is kind of a fault with the whole nature of curved arrows. People have shown, also have designed all sorts of different curved arrows. There's one out there, please don't write it down. I think this is a kind of silly thing that somebody else, there's another guy who's got this convention for curved arrows. And so what that's supposed to mean is form the bond here. They're called bouncy curved arrows. I don't know what that's supposed to be. It's like, is that a McDonald's arch or what? I just. <laughs> so when we draw the curved arrow, we're not in, we, by, by drawing the product, we're saying where the hydrogen is going. All right, so what we have now is two carbocations. But we have two competing pathways. How do we differentiate between them? When you have two things, like two reactions or two mechanism steps, and we'll see this very frequently with mechanism steps that have two potential different products from that step, which one do we pick? Give you a metaphor. At the end of class today, you have a choice of staying here and sleeping or going and having a really nice dinner with your friends, maybe go seeing a movie, you know, hooking up with someone you never hooked up before, you know, that kind of <laughs> stuff. Which one do you do? Please don't tell me you stay here and sleep. Because <laughs> I think there's a class in here after us anyway. You pick the one that makes you the most happy. Molecules do the same thing, right? This guy has a choice. I can accept the proton here and make that carbocation, or I can accept the proton here and make that carbocation. Which pathway makes the molecule happier? The bottom one. Because this carbocation is more mm than this one. Stable. Remember the idea that when you have competing pathways, the more stable product, in this case it's a mechanism step product, what we call an intermediate, we're not down in the mechanism, but it's the more stable thing that's favored. Primary, tertiary. So the tertiary is favored, this is the major one. But we're not done. Carbocations are not generally the kinds of things you put in bottles. There are a few exceptions to that. For the most part, carbocations are very reactive. They tend to go on and do other things. We don't write them as reaction products. So every time we see a carbocation in a reaction mechanism, regardless of where it comes from, here we've made it by protonating an alkene, we think I was hoping everybody else would say it too. That's OK. Maybe you can say it loud enough for everybody. Every time you see a carbocation in a reaction mechanism, regardless of where it comes from, there we go. You think about resonance first because resonance tells you about stability and the potential for other products. But there's no resonance issue here. So we don't have to worry about that. After we've thought about resonance, we think about carbocation fates. And all, remember, all three of the fates can compete. But we know where we're trying to get. We're talking about addition. So what are the possibilities? Could we lose a proton? Is there a base present that it's sufficiently strong to deprotonate a carbocation? What do you mean no? Carbocations are desperate. desperate and not fussy. Is there a base present? Water. No, there's no water. <laughs> what else did I make here? Br minus. Remember, just because in this case the conjugate base has gone away from the Br minus, that doesn't, just because we don't write it doesn't mean it's not there. It may come back and participate. If you tend to forget about that, the fact that it's there, then get in the habit of drawing it in. It doesn't hurt to draw it in. We often leave it out because it just doesn't do anything. But it's there. So it could deprotonate and go backwards. That's reversible. But that doesn't move us forward. What about rearrangement? We had, the, oh, here's our tertiary carbocation. That one can actually go backwards as well. Tertiary carbocation, that's the major one for us to talk about. Can it, uh, what, could this rearrange? Probably won't because it doesn't get any better than tertiary. The primary, if any of this is made, could rearrange, but there's, this isn't the major pathway. This is not the major product. So it could rearrange, but what else can it do then? We talked about lose a proton, that doesn't help. Rearrange, that doesn't help, so. Capture a nucleophile. What nucleophile should I capture? Don't say water. <laughs> Br minus. What do we think about the nucleophilicity of Br minus? Pretty good. Uh, okay. Not the best. 
or I never want to see you again. It's okay. It's not the best in the world. It's okay. So you might say, I don't know if I want to capture that. That's absolutely right. Thank you. Somebody's been reading the script. <laughs> Carbocations are desperate but not fussy. It doesn't care if this is a lousy nucleophile. Capture the nucleophile. There we go. So I'm going to complete the other pathway just as well because it would also, a small amount of this would be formed. Now this bottom product, the tertiary bromide, is the major one. This is the minor product of this process because the, this comes from the, more, from the major carbocation. This idea, that addition of this HX electrophile to the alkene in a particular way, so that the hydrogen, that's what we're going to talk about here, the fact that the hydrogen is on the end of the alkene, which is less substituted to begin with. This is the end of the alkene that only had one attachment. This is the end of the alkene that had three. The fact that it, only that it adds in that particular way, the fact that this is a major product, was noted by a guy named Markovnikov in his PhD thesis in 1870. And it became known as Markovnikov's rule. When you add HX, the H adds to the end of the alkene, which is the least substituted. Now Markovnikov didn't say it in terms of carbocations because bear in mind this was 1870 and the, the electron wasn't going to be discovered until 1898, let alone the idea of carbocations. But that's Markovnikov's rule. Now another way to remember Markovnikov's rule sometimes is them that has gets. In terms of the alkene, CH2, that's the end of the alkene that has the most hydrogens. It gets the hydrogens. The rich get richer. You can add HCl, HI the same way. Now when we come back on Monday, we're going to apply this to an alkyne. So work through the same process with an alkyne and see what happens. And that's where we will pick up. Have a good weekend. Thank <laughs> you.